Hi everyone, welcome to our webinar today. This webinar is a presentation of Clean Energy Group's Resilient Power Project, and our topic for this webinar is the economics of resilient solar plus storage for critical infrastructure. We have guest speakers with us today from NREL and CUNY. And before we pass it over to them, we have a few quick housekeeping notes for you. All of our attendees for this webinar are in listen-only mode. That means that you can hear us, hopefully, but we can't hear you. You have a couple of options to join the audio portion of this webinar. You can either call in using your telephone, or you can connect using your computer mic and speakers. Uh, and a very important note, we ask that you please submit your questions throughout the webinar as you think of them by typing them in to the question box on your webinar console and hitting send. We will be reading through your questions as you send them in, and we will get to as many as we can at the end of our presentations. So again, please submit your questions as you think of them. We will get to as many as we can at the end. And a final note, this webinar is being recorded. You will find a recording of this webinar, as well as all of our previous Resilient Power Project webinars, on our website at resilient-power.org. And with that, I will pass it over to our host for this webinar. That is Seth Mullendor. Seth is a project director here at Clean Energy Group, and he will be uh, introducing our topic for today and introducing our guest speakers. Over to you, Seth. Thank you, Sam, and thanks everybody for joining us today. I'm just going to give you a quick background on uh, the Resilient Power Project, which is uh, bringing you the webinar today, and Clean Energy Group. Um, the Resilient Power Project is, is a project of Clean Energy Group, which is a national nonprofit that uh, works towards uh, the advancement of clean energy technology through innovation in finance, technology, and policy. Uh, Resilient Power Project is also uh, in partnership with the Meridian Institute. Um, and uh, the, the project is supported by a number of foundations, JPB, BAR, Cred D, Cummings, and CERDA Foundation. We also have a sister organization, uh, Clean Energy State Alliance, which is a uh, coalition of state energy offices um, and other organizations working towards uh, the advancement of clean energy technologies at the state level. Uh, to give you a little bit of background about the Resilient Power Project, uh, it has been in effect for, uh, this is the third year now, and the project works towards um, bringing reliable, clean energy technologies for resiliency applications. So it came in, in the wake of Hurricane Sandy uh, when there was a lot of widespread outages and a lot of diesel generators failed. Uh, you could advance to the next slide, please, Sam. And uh, we uh, looked towards the combination of solar and energy storage primarily as a reliable form of clean energy uh, to provide resiliency in an emergency situation. Uh, in this effort, we work a lot with uh, city officials as well as state and federal to put into place supportive policies and programs for the technologies. Uh, and there is a um, focus in the project to protect low-income and uh, similarly vulnerable communities with a focus on developing projects in uh, affordable housing, senior housing, as well as critical public facilities like police and fire stations, healthcare facilities, and emergency shelters. Uh, through foundation support, we do have a technical assistance fund that can provide some uh, assistance for pre-development costs in these types of projects to do initial technical and financial feasibility uh, to help get projects started uh, for developers uh, and, and figure out if uh, resilient solar and storage makes sense for a project. Uh, th through the effort, we have developed a number of resources, uh, reports, newsletters, webinars, like the one today. Those are all available on our website, resilient-power.org. Uh, we also have a number of other resources there, such as uh, a group of featured installation of resilient solar and storage projects that have been installed, as well as a project map and uh, tools for project developers. So I encourage anyone that's interested in resilient power and learning more about the project to please take a look at our website, resilient-power.org. Uh, with that, I'd like to begin the presentation for today. It's a very interesting topic, uh, bringing the value of resiliency into the, the economic considerations for development of solar and storage projects for resiliency, which is 
a difficult topic that uh, is, is, is a difficult issue to, to value resiliency when you're talking about these. So very, very good topic today and a really interesting study that was put out by CUNY and NREL. Uh, we have three speakers today. Uh, first up will be Erica Helson, who is a New York State Solar Ombudsman with Sustainable CUNY. And uh, she supports efforts to increase the amount of resilient solar in New York by leading working groups that will reduce the technological, regulatory, and financial barriers to integrating solar PV into emergency resiliency planning. Uh, Erica also worked for uh, NYSERDA in uh, commercial and industrial energy efficiency incentive programs and works as a project manager for a solar installer in California. She also has experience in disaster recovery and the need for emergency power as an employee of the American Red Cross, where she engaged in disaster response activities in Los Angeles and Texas. Uh, Erica has a BA in political science from Fitzgerald College and an MPA in environmental policy from Columbia University. Uh, and then we'll have Lars Lazell, who is also a New York State Solar Ombudsman for Sustainable CUNY. Uh, he's a mechanical engineer who focused primarily on energy efficiency technologies, distributed renewables, and energy storage. He spent most of his career working on technology to market activities and system integration in renewable energy. He's currently engaged with a number of initiatives that remove barriers to distributed energy generation and energy storage implementation through uh, New York Solar Smart DG Hub and the New York City Grid Ready Projects. Then we'll have Kate Anderson with uh, the National Renewable Energy Lab. She's a group manager there and a senior engineer manager of the engineering and modeling group at NREL. She leads a team of technical experts who support federal, state, and local entities with techno-economic modeling and analysis, field assessments, design and implementation of energy efficiency, renewable energy, and storage opportunities. Uh, she's also program lead for development of NREL's REOPT model, which is a platform for energy system integration optimization used to evaluate cost optimal selection and sizing of energy assets for grid connected and off grid systems. Uh, she provides technical assistance for efficiency and renewable technologies to meet energy goals, developing net zero energy strategies, uh, energy security, and evaluating PV interconnection solutions on New York City's secondary network distribution system. Kate has a BS in aerospace engineering from MIT and MS in renewable energy systems technologies from Lowboro University and an MBA from University of New Mexico. Uh, so glad to have them all here today. And uh, with that, I will turn it over to Erica. Great. Thanks, Seth. Um, so thank you all for joining us. We're very excited about this report and to communicate it out to all of you who are listening. So thanks again for joining us. Um, today we're going to review this report that uh, CUNY and NREL published under our DG Hub program. And this uh, report looks at the economic and resiliency benefits of solar PV and energy storage on critical, critical infrastructure. In terms of agenda, I'll give a quick introduction of what the DG Hub is. Lars will talk about how we valued resiliency in this report. Kate Anderson will talk about our methodology and how we size the solar uh, storage and generators for these three critical infrastructure sites that we studied. And then we'll discuss some of our key findings and takeaways as well as take some questions. So just a quick overview of the DG Hub. Um, the DG Hub, like the Resilient Power Project, was formed out of Sandy. Um, we noticed in New York City that though we have a, a really vibrant solar market and we've seen a lot of growth over the past eight to 10 years, after Sandy, what became apparent was that this, uh, this solar market was not a resilient solar market. So very few of, you know, virtually none of the solar systems installed in New York City were able to provide emergency power uh, when we needed it most after Hurricane Sandy. So the DG Hub is a platform that brings together uh, stakeholders to remove soft costs to solar and storage deployment. Um, we're working towards creating a more resilient distributed energy system in New York City with a path for expansion across the state and the country. And we do this by engaging stakeholders who are involved in the solar and storage space, um, creating st strategic pathways. So we're removing, as I mentioned, uh, soft costs to solar and storage deployment. And our end goal is to recruit, increase uh, resilient PV deployment 
in the city. And again, we feel that many of the lessons we've learned in New York City are applicable across the state and the country. In its current form, the DG Hub Resilient Solar Project is supported by the Department of Energy under the Solar Market Pathways Program. It's a three-year grant, and we're in our second year. And the initiative is led by Sustainable CUNY in partnership with the National Renewable Energy Lab, as well as Meister Consultants Group. So the report that we're discussing today, this economic and resiliency impact of PV and storage on New York critical infrastructure, is one of the projects completed under the DG Hub. You can find a full version of this report at NewYorkSolarMaps.com. Uh, you can look at the, uh, the URL down there at the bottom of the screen. Um, and I'm going to give you just a very high-level summary of what this report is all about. Uh, the reason we conducted this report um, is because we'd like to see more resilient solar on New York City critical infrastructure. And in order to do that, we need to better understand the, the cost as well as the benefits uh, resilient PV on our critical infrastructure. So we conducted this analysis of three sites. We looked at a school, a fire station, and a cooling center, and we looked at actual energy data for these three sites, and we sized different um, systems, that, including PV, energy storage, as well as generators, uh, to look at the different benefits those systems provide. And as Seth mentioned, uh, what's unique about this report is that we try to incorporate a value of resiliency. So, you know, we've seen in the past PV and energy storage um, analyses looking at the economics of these systems. Um, but the twist that we took in this report was to incorporate this value of resiliency to look at how that really changes the, the economics as well as the emergency power benefits. So with that, I'm going to hand it over to Lars so he can talk about how we incorporated this value of resiliency in this project. Yeah, thank you, Erica. So, um, yeah, I'm going to talk about uh, the value of resiliency, why there is value in resiliency, and how we calculated the value of resiliency for this particular project. Um, and one thing I wanted to mention right away is that you know, the, the reason that, that we think this is important is because it's not something that's currently addressed in a lot of research studies. Currently, typically only the, the on-grid services are included in the economic analysis. So you can see here in this left graphic what types of analysis are currently um, typically performed. And that's uh, things like, things like uh, uh, peak shaving or, or load shifting, uh, you know, things like that kind of typical uh, value that you can get out of an energy storage system, but for this study, we wanted to we wanted to include those value streams, but also you know think more about this value of resiliency and and include that um, into the analysis, into the cash flows, um, and see what sort of impact that had on economic feasibility. Um, so with this report, you know the argument that that we were making is that these off-grid services are are equally important and should be included in analysis, just like the on-grid services are. Especially when you start talking about natural disasters um, and times when there's extended grid outages and you know first responders need need power and um, you know to to sort of begin their recovery process. You know this is a very very important uh, uh, value to to consider. So we also expect that the importance and the value of resiliency will increase moving forward. And the reason that we think this is because if you look at how power outages have changed over time, the non-weather related power outages have stayed relatively flat, whereas if you look at weather related power outages, those have been increasing um, for the last couple of decades. And you know, if, if you look at the news or any sort of projections as to what's going to happen in the future, you know, this is this is going to continue at this rate or, or even increase as as uh, storms get stronger and more frequent. Um, so we can expect more outages. And with more outages, you can expect the costs of these outages to increase. Um, so in the decades leading up to 2012, um, it been estimated that 
between 185 and 335 billion dollars um, have have uh, those are the kind of the magnitude of costs that that um, power outages costs have costed in the United States. Um, and you can see here, just since 2009, this this trajectory is is increasing, and you know that's something that that conceivably will continue. So now, hopefully, I've convinced you that resiliency does have value. But how do we actually calculate that for a site? This was this was something that we had to do some research on, um, since it's not really not really performed a lot. So we looked at a variety of different methods for for um, for costing out and valuing this resiliency. Um, the the first way that we looked at was calculating the cost of an outage. So you can you can look at an individual site, you know, look at site specific considerations such as, you know, how much does it cost if a manufacturing facility goes down, how much um, does it cost if there's if there's lost staff time. Um, you know, lost lost rent, thing, things to that effect. Um, you know, you can you can look at a very granular site specific uh, cost of of a utility outage. And there's an EPRI guide that was released a number of years ago that walks through kind of the process for for capturing those costs or categorizing those costs. Um, and uh, and 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 that's uh, something that people have been doing for a while. You can also look at this on sort of a macro level or the national level, look at national outages, um, see what sort of costs have been incurred by organizations over time, um, you know, from power outages that have happened in the past, and, and um, you know, try to, try to use that data to extrapolate out to current conditions. There was this, this workbook that was developed uh, under the New York Prize Initiative, that that sort of took a hybrid approach to this, where um, where there you know it included some site specific costs, but also included um, sort of these macro level costs from from these national surveys. Paired those with societal costs, things like first responders not being able to go out and do their jobs, you know, firefighters not being able to go and do their jobs, those sorts of things. Um, but uh, but that was that was something that was that was used um, here in New York State for this this um, this New York Prize initiative. And another way that this could be looked at is from the industry perspective. So what sort of uh, what sort of costs are incurred, um, you know, during during a natural disaster? And the insurance companies have been doing this for for a very long time, so they're very good at looking at um, you know the impacts of these sorts of things. Um, so so that's another way. So sort of a completely different way of looking at the value of resiliency is also to look at the cost of other forms of emergency power. And, and the thought here is that if, if a customer or a site is willing to pay for, for resiliency, you know, what's the cost of that, of that next best alternative? So something like a generator or a combined heat and power system. Or in uninterruptible power supply. So these are things that that organizations are currently purchasing and implementing in order to get resiliency. So this is another way that you can that you can sort of think about um, this value of resiliency is what are people currently willing to pay for that. So the method that we are, that we decided to move forward with was this national outage survey method. And I'll talk about that a little bit more in a second, um, but but before that, I want to make a, a, a distinction here um, that this value that we calculated, this value of resiliency, is different than cash flow into a project. Um, and the reason for that is because once you've established that something has value, there also needs to be a way to monetize that value. So there are a lot of different ways that you can monetize resiliency, but currently none of those are widely used. Um, so, so this is an area that that we're currently researching, and we actually have staff coming online that are that are going to dig more into this and 
and you know find out ways that that this value of resiliency can actually be monetized and you know look at business models that could potentially be be set up in order to to translate this value into um, cash flow and and there there are other organizations that are working on this as well one one uh, demonstration project that's going on through the Rev initiative is the virtual power plant and that is a project with Con Edison, Sun Power, and Sunverge, where they're looking at things like how much is a is a site host willing to pay for resiliency? You know, how does that get built into a a, a business model and a cash flow? Um, things like that. But but um, before I jumped into the uh, our calculation methodology here, I wanted to mention that that there is a difference between value and cash flow. So back to the method that we used to calculate the value of resiliency, we settled on the national outage survey method and the tool that we used to to uh, come up with with this you know this dollar amount for value of resiliency was the ice calculator or the interruption cost estimate calculator. This is a DOE tool. Uh, it's available online icecalculator.com where you put information in about a site. Uh, put some some reliability metrics in from from whatever the serving utility is, and then it kicks out a number a, a dollars per year for uh, for cost of utility interruption. So the types of information that you need for the ice calculator are what type of customer the the location is, whether it's commercial, industrial, the location, so what region of the country. Uh, average energy use, which which scales the the value of resiliency or the the cost of an outage, uh, industry type, and then backup capabilities. So those are pieces of information that we knew about these three sites. We were able to collect those just by interacting with site staff. And then the ice calculator also takes two grid reliability metrics, safety and KD. So safety is the average number of interruptions per customer. Uh, per year, and so that gives you um, uh, that gives you an idea of the frequency of grid outage for that particular location. And the next input on grid reliability is KD, the average duration per customer affected. So the the length of grid outage that can be expected when the grid does go down. So for these three sites, we pulled reliability data from Con Edison because Con Edison is a serving utility for for these facilities that we looked at. There were two facilities that were on the network grid and one facility that was on the radial grid. So we we did this reliability. We pulled these reliability metrics for for both of the grids that Con Ed Con Ed operates, and this is publicly available data. Um, it's uh, it's something that you can go to the utility website, look up, and you know they'll have all of the previous years. We we were able to find data back 14 years, um, and we used the we used a five-year average for the reliability inputs in this study. And as you can see in the plot here, um, the data supports the earlier assertion that I made that storms are increasing. Um, and uh, are increasing outages, both frequency and duration. These two lines that you can see in the plot, the, the orange line and the blue line, both show that uh, you know between between the early 2000s and 2014, uh, the the duration and the frequency of grid outages are increasing. And this is data that's reported with storms, so you can you can see that that um, you know as we said earlier, the 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 storms are are resulting in more grid outages, more costs customers. And once we plugged all of this information into the ICE calculator, we came up with a summary for all three of these sites. So we calculated both a value of resiliency in dollars per hour per year and the total cost of outages in a typical year or in an average year. The value of resiliency dollars per hour per year went into the models that we ran for the sites, um, 
and then you know as as reliability was improved in the models, then these were the numbers that were that were applied to the economic scenarios. So a one thing I wanted to point out here is that there's a large difference on the Con Edison grid between the network and the radial grids. The radial grid has a much higher value of resiliency than the network grids, and the reason for that is because the network grids are much more reliable than the radial grids. So the value of resiliency is higher on the radial grid, um, and that's that's because there's just more outages and and um, there's more opportunity to improve reliability on the radial grid than there is on the network grid. Um, and so, looking at at these these numbers, um, and then also looking at the duration of outages, the cost of outages in dollars per year is on the right hand side here. And this shows kind of the, the total opportunity for, for savings, um, you know, kind of the magnitude of cost that, that go into the, the economics of these projects to, uh, you know, to, to, to show how, how this impacts the, um, the different scenarios that we looked at. So with that, I will pass the, um, I will pass it over to Kate. She'll talk more about the process for evaluation and then the modeling. Hi everyone, this is Kate Anderson from the National Renewable Energy Lab. Um, and as Lars mentioned, I'm going to go over, over the process that we used um, for this analysis. So our first step was to select the sites that we wanted to include in this analysis. And we were looking to include three sites. And we wanted to represent a range of the critical infrastructure facility types in New York City. And so we selected those um, based on how prone they were to outages, um, whether or not they had existing backup generation. Um, we looked for sites that were in evacuation zones and that had close proximity to floodplains. Um, we wanted to find sites that had um, suitable roof areas for PV with limited shading and also had enough space for PV and batteries. Um, we looked at the number of people that the shelters had supported during storms, like Irene and Sandy. And we also looked for sites that had support from the building staff. And then finally, we, we looked at sites um, that had high demand charges and also sites where energy efficiency upgrades were being implemented or considered. Um, so based on those criteria and working with um, the New York Department of Citywide Administrative Services, the New York City Department of Education, the New York City Fire Department, and also the New York City Housing Authority, we selected three specific sites, which were a fire station, a coastal storm shelter, and a cooling center. Um, and then once we had selected those sites, we conducted site visits. And um, the graphic that you see on the right on this slide is just an example of the rooftop analysis that we did at one of the sites to look for areas where we might be able to place PV. And so um, the site assessments included measuring the space available for PV, um, taking measurements of shading, evaluating the conditions of the roof, um, looking at the angle and azimuth, um, and then also looking at potential electrical interconnection points for the PV and storage systems. Um, and then after conducting those site visits, we started to define the assumptions for the analysis. So this included um, looking at PV and battery costs. And for this, um, we conducted a survey of installers to look at what costs were currently for both PV and battery in New York City. Um, and we also looked at the historic prices that had been paid by DCAF and um, the New York City Solarize contract pricing. Um, we also considered what ownership and financing models we wanted to assume for this analysis. So um, some of the sites preferred a direct ownership model um, where they purchased and owned the system and maintained it, whereas others preferred a third-party arrangement where a developer would come in and install and maintain the system and the, um, the site would purchase energy from that developer. Um, we looked at incentives that were available. So under those third-party mechanisms, the sites were um, eligible for the federal investment tax credit and accelerated depreciation. Um, and then all of the sites, whether they were a third party or a direct ownership model, were eligible for the NYSERDA to New York Sun PV incentive. Um, and then as Lars mentioned, we calculated grid interruption costs or value of resili resiliency costs for each of the sites. Um, and then 
we determine the critical load at each site using one of two methods. Um, our preferred method was to have the site specify which equipment they needed to run during an outage, and then we would calculate the energy requirements of that equipment, um, figure out the timing of when that equipment needed to run, and build up the critical load profile based on that information. Um, when that information wasn't available, we just assumed that the critical load was a certain percent of the typical load. And so that was a backup option um, if the information we needed to build up the critical load profile was not available. Um, next, on number five, we defined the different scenarios that we were going to model. Um, so we looked at different combinations of PV, storage, and backup diesel generation systems. And then we looked at designing these systems first purely for economic savings, and then second to sustain specified outage periods. Um, and then we determine the resiliency value as Lars described earlier based on historical outages as well as the customer type and energy use of that particular building. And then we completed modeling. Um, and for this particular effort we used NREL's REAP platform for energy systems integration and optimization, um, which is an optimization model that provides concurrent multiple technology integration and optimization capabilities. And we customize it here at NREL for a variety of different applications. And so for this particular analysis, we use REAP to evaluate how renewable energy and storage can be incorporated either on its own or alongside conventional generation in a microgrid to provide economic savings while it's grid connected for example, through demand reduction and time of use shifting, and then also to meet critical loads during grid outages. And um, we use the REAP model to optimize the most cost-effective system size, as, long, as well as the operating strategy um, for each of these systems. And then finally, we analyze the results and um, are disseminating them in the form of a report, as well as this webinar and conference presentations. So moving on to the next slide, um, these are the scenarios that we looked at. Um, first, we looked purely at PV and storage size for economic savings. So in this first scenario, scenario one, we didn't impose any resiliency requirement. And then in the second scenario, scenario two, we again were looking only at PV and storage, but in this case, we required the system to meet the critical load for a certain outage length. And we looked at um, two different outage lengths for each of the buildings we analyzed. And in this presentation, I'm just going to present the results for one of the outage lengths. But if you're interested, you can look at the paper for um, the full set of results. In scenario three, we then added a generator to the potential um, technologies that could sustain the critical load during this outage. So we looked at PV storage and a generator hybrid system. Uh, again, size to meet that critical load during the outage. Um, and in all of these cases, the systems meet the critical load, in, or sorry, in scenario two, three, and four, the systems meet the critical load during the outage, but then they can also operate for economic gain while the system is grid connected. Um, in scenario four, this was somewhat just of a, a comparison scenario, so we looked at a generator only, which is um, typically what most buildings in New York City that have backup power have right now. Um, so just a generator size to meet the critical load. Um, so I'm going to go through one of the example sites. I mentioned um, there was a fire station, a coastal storm shelter, and a cooling center. So here we're going to talk about the fire station. Um, the fire station was on a utility rate called SD91 conventional, um, which had demand charges of about 32 63 per kilowatt, um, and those had a 12 to 18 month look back, and then energy charges of 4.3 to 4.8 cents per kilowatt hour, um, depending on whether it was summer or winter. Based on the roof area available at this site, um, the maximum PV size that could be installed was 10 kilowatts, and then the load varied from a minimum of 2.86 kilowatts up to 63 kilowatts, with an average load of about 15 kilowatts. And this was one of the sites where we um, did not have information on the specific equipment that they needed to run during outage. So we assumed that the critical load was 65% of the typical load. 
So here are the results for the first scenario. And this is where we were sizing PV and storage just for economic savings. So in this case, we weren't requiring it to sustain an outage of any particular length. So um, in the middle column there called without resiliency value, you'll see the results that we got when we did not include a cost of grid interruptions. Um, so here, the recommendation um, was that the most cost-effective system was a 10 kilowatt PV system and a relatively small battery of 43 kilowatt hours and 16 kilowatts. And for this system, the total capital cost is about 69,000. And over the 25-year life cycle of the project, after you um, incorporate that initial capital cost, the total net present value or the total savings that this site could expect to see would be about $22,000. And so, you know, the economics are somewhat marginal. There is savings, but it's only $22,000 over a 25-year period. Um, the simple payback is about 16 years. And then um, the percent of the critical load that the system can support for a 22-hour outage varies between 2 and 73%. And the reason that there's such a wide variation there is because the um, length or the level of resiliency provided by that system really depends on a few things. Um, it depends on when the outage occurs because the solar resource and the size of the load vary depending on when that outage starts, um, vary by time of day and time of year. And then the state of charge of the battery varies as well. So if this, if this site had just been using the battery for peak shaving, then the battery state of charge might be low and so it might provide um, less resiliency than a fully charged battery. Um, and then you can see on the, in the right column there, titled with resiliency value, that the, um, the system sizes change when you include the cost of grid interruptions. So in this case, we're again sizing the PV system at 10 kilowatts, and you might remember that's the maximum size that can fit on this rooftop, so you really can't have a larger system at this site. Um, but the battery size uh, increases quite a bit. So it um, goes up to 213 kilowatt hours and 31 kilowatts. Uh, the capital cost increases as well because you're pay now paying for that larger battery, but the net present value is much higher. And the primary reason for that larger net present value is that now you are offsetting some of those grid interruption costs because this system can, um, can save some of those costs for you by providing power during the outage. And so um, by avoiding those costs of grid interruption, um, you now have a much higher net present value, so a savings of about 324000 over the 25-year life cycle of the project. And you'll see that the simple payback goes down quite a bit as well to about 6.1 years. And the um, percentage of the critical load that the system can support for the 22-hour outage increases quite a bit. And again, a large range here, but um, 47 to 264%. So um, a, a relatively large portion of the time it can support that full critical load. So this is what um, the system looks like during a typical operating um, um, season. So from this is just we're just showing one week in September, but you'll see that the PV and battery are working together to reduce that peak load. And this is where the primary source of savings is coming from from for these systems. Um, so where, whereas the peak would have been 60 kilowatts before on September 12th, now it's around 45 kilowatts. So you're seeing a, a 15 kilowatt reduction in peak demand. And that's providing um, a lot of the savings that um, this, this site gets from installing the PV and battery system. This next site looks at, this next slide looks at scenarios two to four which is where we size the systems to meet resiliency needs. So in this case, um, we required the system to sustain a 22-hour outage. And we selected an outage period that we considered a worst case period. And by that, I mean that the solar resource was pretty low and the load was pretty high. And so we felt that if it could sustain that 22-hour per period, then it could sustain other 22-hour periods throughout the year. Um, and so in this case, we again have that maximum 10 kilowatt PV system, the maximum number that can fit on the roof in the um, PV and storage column. And we have a very large battery, a 613 kilowatt hour, 40 kilowatt battery system. 
And the reason that there's such a large battery in this case is that um, the PV system is really pretty undersized compared to the load. So the battery basically has to fully charge up before the outage, and then it just continually discharges during the outage. And that battery is providing most of, most of the energy during the outage because the PV just can't um, provide all of the energy that's required. So you'll see if you rely solely on PV and storage to meet the critical load during that outage, um, you need a pretty large system, and it comes at a pretty high capital cost, um, almost 390000 with the net present value, if you do not consider the resiliency value, is very negative, about negative 256,000. However, if you add in the resiliency value, um, it becomes positive. So this is where you know, it's important to think about whether or not you, you want to include that resiliency value. Because if you consider the cost of those grid interruptions, then this is actually a positive economic investment. Um, in the next column there, we look at PV storage and a generator. So in this case, we're pairing a resilient PV system with a generator. And so a smaller battery is required um, because the generator can pick up a lot of the extra load. And so in this case, we have a lower capital cost and um, a much less negative net present value. You'll see it's only negative 1,679, even when you don't include a resiliency value. And when you do include a resiliency value, it's very positive. And so this, um, this was one of our key findings across all the sites, that in general, this hybrid system of pairing PV and storage with a generator was typically the most cost effective, um, because the PV and storage could provide economic savings while grid connected. And they could provide a little bit of help and a little bit of resiliency during outages but that generator could really um, provide a lot of that additional resiliency needed during outages. And for comparison, we show the generator only scenario on the right. Um, and here you see that um, if you have only a generator, you need a larger generator um, to sustain that outage. It uses more fuel and um, the, the NPV of the system over the 25 years is smaller. And this is what um, those systems look like during an outage. Um, so the top graph here is PV and storage, and the black line on the top is the, the load. And so you can see on September 6th and September 8th, which is the first day and the third day shown here, um, this is normal grid connected operation. So much of the energy required is coming from the grid, but the PV and storage systems are being used to shave that peak. So again, this is where you're getting your, your economic savings from. Um, in that middle day, when you have an outage, you'll see that the blue grid goes away, and the entire um, energy requirement is being served by the PV and the battery system. Um, and again, you can see there that the PV really serves a pretty small portion of, of the load, and that's why such a large battery was required. On the bottom graph here, we bring in a generator. And so again, on the first and the third day, September 6th and 8th, the um, smaller PV and battery system are being used to shave peak. Um, there's a little bit lower savings there because you have a smaller PV and battery system in this case. Um, but on that middle day there, you can see that the generator is serving the majority of the load, but what the PV and battery system are doing there are really cutting off the peak in that load such that you can have a smaller generator and um, you can still meet the total requirements of the site. So at this point, I'm going to hand it back to Erica, who is going to discuss some of the key findings of the report. Thanks, Kate. And um, I want to make sure that we do have time for questions. So I will try to breeze through this fairly quickly. Um, so just to highlight a couple of our key findings, and these are all summarized in the report. Um, in the conclusion section. So if you'd like to see more about what conclusions we drew from this report, I'd, uh, I'd recommend checking that out. So one of the main things that we wanted to answer was, um, you know, if you are sizing a PV and storage system for economic savings, because that is typically what developers do and what host sites will do in order to minimize their costs, we wanted to see, is this a good resiliency solution? What kind of resiliency do you get? And our conclusion was that you get moderate resiliency benefits. Um, so you can save on your costs through the demand charge um, reductions. 
depending on the shape of the load. Um, but sustaining that full critical load with PV and storage, as Kate mentioned, was pretty cost prohibitive. Uh, this example is different from the fire station, which Kate reviewed. This is from the school shelter. And this, this site was a, an interesting comparison because whereas the fire station has this very small roof space, so uh, minimal PV, and then a very high critical load because of the important function that a fire station um, provides, the school shelter had a lot of roof space and then a really relatively small um, critical load. So the recommended system size, if you're looking at um, maximizing economic savings and not imposing uh, a resiliency requirement, meaning you know you don't have to um, sustain a certain number number of hours of an outage, was 50 kW solar, 35 kW 74 kilowatt hour battery, um, and this supported a range of outages. So. If you're looking at a short duration outage, seven hours, you could support around half of your critical loads under a worst case scenario, and then about two and a half times your full critical load um, under best case scenario. And that shrinks, of course, if you move to a 51 hour outage, about two days. Another key finding, um, as Kate mentioned, she already touched on this, so I'm not gonna spend too much time, but hybrid systems tend to be the most cost effective um, emergency power solution, and that's when resiliency is really your, your primary benefit, or rather your primary driver. Um, this key finding, I think, is, is fairly straightforward common sense. Um, we found that when you include the cost of grid interruptions, in other words, including a value of resiliency, this really improves the project economics, and as Lars already highlighted, that, um, that benefit is much larger when you're looking at a radial uh, site that's on a radial grid where outages are more frequent versus the network grid where you, you don't experience as many outages. Um, lastly, adding storage can improve PV economics by reducing demand charges. So it was interesting for, these are NIPA customers, that's, the, um, that's for public institutions, the uh, utility provider. NIPA customers have very high demand charges but relatively low energy charges. So in this case, uh, we actually use the uh, demand charge savings, the storage system savings, to offset the cost of the PV. And in New York City, um, the, the government is pursuing putting solar on many of our municipal buildings in order to, to meet a um, mayoral goal of 100 megawatts by, I believe, 2020. Um, so we, we think that it's a good sign to see that the economics of PV um, on municipal buildings could be improved by incorporating energy storage. And in fact, New York City is developing um, resilient PV programs, and we're encouraged to see that. A little bit on future work. So this report um, raised some important questions. We want to look into whether or not regulations will need to be changed in order to um, in order to use PV and storage as a code compliant option for resiliency. We need more uh, accurate cost assumption data to make sure that um, you know, our analysis is accurate because these systems are relatively uncommon. It was a little difficult to come up with accurate um, installed cost data to, uh, to use in the model. Um, and then lastly, we need to have more discussion about how resiliency is valued. So as Lars mentioned, this is just one uh, way that you can value resiliency. We're not saying that this is the right way to value resiliency. We were just using you know, resources that are available today so that we can start this conversation, um, but it's, it's very site-specific and will definitely require some more investigation. All right, so with that, we have all of our contact info, info up here if you have further questions, um, and I understand we have time for some questions now. Yes, we do have time for some questions. So thank you, Erica, Lars, and Kate. That was a great presentation. Um, we don't have a lot of time, and we have a few questions here that, that uh, ending thought there by you of the, uh, the need to understand resiliency it actually leads into some questions we had um, just about the limitations of the methodology you use for valuing resiliency. Uh, it seemed like the main difference between, say, the fire station and the cooling center was the difference in the, the network or radial. Um, grid that it was on, um, whereas you would see that uh, you know the, the value of having a cooling center and a heat wave is, is obviously quite important and has real-world 
health implications. Um, that's not probably captured by those values. And maybe you could just speak on that a little bit more uh, on the limitations and, and what your thoughts are to address those. Yeah, sure, I can, I can jump in there. Um, and yeah, you, you definitely made a really good point there. Because we use that national outage method, that's going to be sort of, you know, everything, everything baked into one number. You know, that's going to be your manufacturing facilities, that's going to be schools, it's going to be residences, you know, it's, it's, it's all these different building types um, sort of combined into, into one average number that is applied over a region. So if you really want site-specific numbers, it's, um, you, you know, you, you need to do a little bit more investigation into the site itself. The reason that we decided to use those national numbers is because it's something that, um, that is applicable across a lot of different facility types. So we said, let's use this number. That'll, that'll get us some, you know, kind of a middle of the road. It's not going to overestimate. It's not going to underestimate. But it'll give us something, you know, something kind of middle of the road that we can use. Um, but, yeah, I mean, if you're dealing with at-risk populations or, um, you know, sites that, that have life safety involved, things like that, obviously that value of resiliency is going to be much higher. Great. So a question for probably for Kate here. Um, how do you, do you account in the modeling for the, the impact of, of cycling the battery on, on the life of the battery? And um, do the, the economics consider replacement of the battery uh, over the 25-year period? Also, what batteries did you assume, uh, what battery technology did you assume in, in the, uh, the modeling? Um, so we assumed a lithium-ion battery, and we assumed that it would need to be replaced once in the 25-year life cycle. And um, in terms of cycling and degradation, um, we start the analysis by assuming, assuming that the battery will last um, basically the 12.5 years to the mid-year point of the analysis. And after we do the analysis, we look at the cycling strategy for the battery, basically the dispatch strategy, and we run that through a rainflow algorithm to um, figure out if our original assumption of it lasting 12.5 calendar years is good or not. Basically, based on the cycling strategy, did it violate that or would it actually have lasted that long? And so um, in this case, it did pass that rainflow algorithm um, check, and so it would have lasted um, the 12.5 years. And that's primarily because the batteries were really, they weren't being used every single day. They were being used to shape peaks kind of strategically on certain days typically just to bring down a few days each month of those really high peaks. Great. Um, and so what was the, uh, the discount, rate used, discount rate used for the, the net present value? Um, for the direct ownership case, we assumed a discount rate of 3.1%. And for the third party case, we assumed that the developer's discount rate was 10%. Great. Uh, there's a question here that I will uh, actually address, and you guys can jump in if you have any other thoughts on it. Uh, it's a question of whether these types of storage projects um, would be eligible for the ITC. Uh, ITC is available for storage projects that are paired with PV, as long as the uh, energy storage system is primarily charged by the PV system. So in the case of the fire station, it's, it's a pretty small PV system. Uh, and a pretty big battery. So in that case, you probably would not be able to, to primarily charge with the PV system. But there are other cases where you could have a comparably sized system. Um, and as long as the battery is charged with PV, uh, primarily, uh, at least 75%, you could get the ITC. So for resiliency applications, that um, that would just be solar and battery that, that are happening. So so it would definitely qualify for, for those occasions when you're doing demand charge uh, peak shaving, uh, as long as you had enough PV to, to charge the battery in order to do that shaving, then, then you could do that. I don't know if, if you guys have any other thoughts on that. Yeah, I'll just add that because critical infrastructure sites tend to be um, public facilities, when we looked at the direct ownership model, we did not include the ITC because there was no tax liability, um, but we did include, I believe, and Kate, correct me if I'm wrong, um, I think we did look at the ITC for third-party ownership systems. That's right. 
Great. And did you consider any other incentives for this? Is there anything available in, in New York that you applied to the to economics? Um, on the PV side, we included the nicer to New York Sun incentive, um, but not on, there were no other incentives on the battery side. We also looked at demand response payments. So there are several demand response programs available in New York, but I believe with the dispatch strategy for the batteries, um, it made more sense to focus on that demand charge management than um, to get those demand response payments. Great, thanks. Um, so there were a couple of questions, this might be a little bit off topic, but there were a couple of questions about a national, natural gas being used as the source for the fossil fuel generator. Um, whether natural gas can be considered reliable in, in these kind of outage situations, um, particularly flooding, and also whether or not the, the generators can do the same kind of uh, demand shaving that uh, an energy storage uh, system could do. Um, <laughs> we, okay, so we did speak with um, a company that specializes in generators to ask if the generator could participate in any of the payment programs. And the response we got was technically yes, but it's very difficult to get through um, regulatory hurdles, so it's unlikely. Um, and we chose diesel generators, I believe, because um, it was more common. Uh, Kate, do you have anything else to add on the natural gas generator side? Um, I know for other microgrid assessments that we've done, um, there's my understanding is that natural gas generators can sometimes be um, a little bit slower to respond than diesel generators. So we typically include at least one diesel generator. Um, sometimes we'll include diesel and natural gas, but typically diesel is faster to respond. So I think um, in terms of resiliency, we often include diesel for that reason. Um, but in this case, as Erica mentioned, we didn't we didn't focus on natural gas. Okay, great. Um, so a couple of questions on outages. Um, one, what was the, the longest outage you considered for these? And then what are the assumptions of, of PV production availability during a storm? Is, was that a set assumption, or was that just based on um, randomness of when an outage might occur? So, so the I can talk. Go ahead, Lars. So I was going to say the um, on, on the outage side, you know, what we looked at were the grid reliability metrics that are publicly available from Con Edison. And the data set that we had went back 14 years. And in those past 14 years, the longest grid outage that we found, or I guess statistically the longest grid outage was from 2002, and that was 73 hours on the radial grid, um, 60 hours on the, on the network grid. Um, and the frequency being 1.39 on the radial grid and 0 0.075 on the on the network grid. So those those were kind of the the worst case scenario, scenarios that that we were able to find. Um, but for for actually running the economic uh, analysis, we used five year averages. So the um, the the KD and the safety numbers from um, from just the last five years. Um, so the 51-hour outage, I think, was the longest that we looked at. Yeah, right, 51-hour outage, yeah. Okay, so it looks like we're just about out of time here. Uh, we have a few more questions that we didn't get to, but I, I think we really addressed all of the main topics that we had multiple questions about. Uh, I encourage anyone whose questions we didn't get to to please contact uh, us at Clean Energy Group or contact uh, the presenters directly with their, you know, their their information available here. Um, Lars, Erica, and Kate, do you guys have any uh, final thoughts you'd like to leave us with? Just that we appreciate everyone's time and questions, and we encourage you to dig into the full results in the report, which is at NewYorkSolarMap.com under the Resources um, and Report section. And um, we look forward to continuing this discussion about how we can value resiliency, and then also work to monetize that value. Yes, I second that. Everybody should go look at it and read the report. Uh, this is a really important topic, and 
it, it, CUNY and, and NRL did a nice job of applying a methodology to this really difficult, difficult topic to get to as far as valuing resiliency. So um, with that, I uh, just want to let everybody know, too, uh, there were some questions. We will be sending out um, the recording, a link to the recording, as well as the slides for the webinar. And um, I'll turn it over to Sam to wrap us up. Thanks, everybody, for joining us. Thanks, Seth. Um, so there is some information on the screen where you can find some more uh, information about Clean Energy Group and our Resilient Power Project. We do have a couple of upcoming webinars that you might be interested in. We have one tomorrow on improving energy resiliency with flow batteries, and we're starting a two-part webinar series next week on uh, bringing the benefits of solar to affordable housing in California. So check those out, and we hope to see you then. Thank you all for joining us for this webinar.